the speaker of the endowment lecture, Dr. Jaydeep Sarangi. Dear uh, members of the faculty and my dear students, a very uh, a warm welcome to all of you and good morning. Let me welcome you all uh, to through SX Swami Kunda Endowment Lecture to be delivered by Dr. Jaydeep Sarangi, Professor of English, Principal of New Alipur College, Kolkata. So let me pass here my dear staff and students to listen to Dr. Jaydeep Sarangi. Extend a hearty welcome to the erudite scholar of the day and extending a warm welcome to each and every one of you. Thank you very much. I bow my head down to Brand Laila. Coming to Chennai is coming to the heart of the nation. When an academic administrator travels from the city of joy to the city of great history and of course Sangam tradition is a matter of cultural journey. It is not only a matter of literary enterprise, it is through which we enter into the heart of India. I personally believe if there is anything called the heart of India, it is translation. It is through translation of color, culture, society, language, from Manipur to Rajasthan to Kashmir to Kerala, we exist. We existed for thousands and thousands of years. We never invaded any country in the history of time. That means the nation called India. I bow my head down to the rich tradition of this part of the world, this part of the country has afforded. All of you are part of it. I thank to all the nation builders who are sitting in front of me in this particular morning at Laila. I know many of you will be the builders of the nation. You will be contributing to several fields and aspects for the lives of our national integrity, national livelihood as an individual, also as a collective force contributing to the rich mosaic of India. I thank my dear friend, your honorable HOD of English department, all faculty members, all prosperous, confident nation builders, UG, PG students, research scholars of Loyola College, because you are a big chunk of our vitality and all our promising tomorrows. What a beautiful sight I had in the morning to witness three of you performing Dalit writers from the three different parts of India. Sharan Kumar Limbale from Maharashtra, then Bama from Tamil Nadu, and then Kalani Thakur from Bengal. Uniqueness and how beautifully you have crafted and set the tone of discussion today and the platform you have done. Platform you have done. And the way you have really performed, I won't forget it in my lifetime. And you brought into the essential subjects who are Dalits and look at the perspective parameters all are contributing into it. And also another matter been discussed whether should we, the Indians, and especially, go on with the term feminism or we should really imbibe the term womanism? Because bell hooks, 
and many important critics actually criticize the term feminism for its limited scope and they introduced intersections by intersections race color gender all are important in determining a movement it is not only what you are fighting with from one parameter but also the intersections of other comport components in culture where you are pressed in coming directly to my address topic of address do we need a separate aesthetics from the dalits and why do we need a separate aesthetics from the dalits little bit about the aesthetics the principles that concerned with nature appreciation of beauty from the perspectives of the beholder by beholder means the onlooker the the persons who are appreciating what is aesthetics how is beauty formulates from the structure in front of us sometimes structures are amorphous but sometimes structures are rhythmic it may be in the form of music may be in the form of painting may be in a form of poem and may be in a beautiful prose writing which sounds like a poem now aesthetics has correlation between the object and the onlooker the object and the viewer and what is beautiful is a very fuzzy concept suppose you read a poem by any tamil writer any tamil poet in your own vernacular i may sound very much nativist in the morning but i have reasons for that because of you know your 19th century 18th 19th century those were the century of the british and 20th century was the century of the americans but 21st century is a century of your and mine century don't you understand it don't you understand it think of 30 years ago indian cricketers had to go to england for for playing county but nowadays on may and june summer heat in chipak stadium everybody comes to play for ipl if you don't play ipl you won't earn your bread your name will be vanished from the scene of cricket so in chennai heat in may june cricketers from all over the globe will come and play for ipl i think all of you are fan of ipl chennai super kings isn't it <laughs> okay so many 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 of uh, followers of uh, cricket but unbelievably my point is we are a confident race our eyes are straight our jaws are stiff we have at our back more than 3 or 4 generations of english studies many of us sitting here are we have many generations of english studies on our back our eyes of criticism our that means i am talking about indian gharana of criticism is developed like anything now think of those who are the students of literature know british literature if you think we have british literature side by side british criticism shakespeare shakespearean criticism shelley shelley in criticism and poetry that means there was simultaneous growth of primary sources material and secondary source material primary material cannot survive without the secondary material because if you want to include them in the syllabus the syllabus committee will say what are the secondary materials you will find on it how can we include and change it to syllabus therefore the british and the americans 
they and even the Greeks, even in Aristotle and time and everything you see, there is simultaneous growth of primary material and secondary material. Now, in 1950s and 60s, that was the ABCD period of criticism of, of Indian writing in English. I hope many of us, we are working on Indian writing in English, and 50s and 60s, that was the beginning time of Indian English criticism. Now, 60, 70 years of premier, continuous uh, attachment and writing process of criticism has given us a status that Indian English criticism is as much important as Indian English writing. So we have two hands now. Earlier, before independence, we had only one hand. That is writing, creative aroma, but no support from criticism. Now we have two hands and we can symmetrically, aesthetically work like anything, anyone in the world. So any, everyone sitting in the room are confident nation builders, confident citizens of the entire globe. Our eyes will tell that we are from a nation which will never bore you because we don't come from a, by, uh, from a monolingual country. We don't come from a culture which is monoculture. Our culture is a bonus. The multilingual, multicultural perspective that we can generate in our writing no other nation except for a few African nations can come out with. That's why, look at the diaspora contribution of Indian writing in English. They are Amitabh Ghosh, Shalman Ruzdi, how many to name, all are booming like anything. Zumpa Lahiri, because their Indian experience is supported by their linguistic experience. And that is unparalleled. Think of, can you mention any British winning the Nobel Prize for Literature in the last 30 years? That means the perspectives, the competence, the cultural hegemony, which is a bonus, which is a, not a help, but a, hin not a, not a hindrance, but a help, becomes an empowering act for the writer coming from India. So you and I, who are in this room, in Loyola College, 1030 today, are all empowered nation builders we, who are unique and can only be understood by the Indians. There is a general criticism. I, I almost in every month I got a thesis from, I was telling, from your state. And I love uh, reading your thesis. That's so beautifully crafted. I, I am in my next bar, possibly, I'll be born as a South Indian. Okay. <laughs> like, like Ambedkar, Ambedkar said, I am a born Hindu, but I will not die as a Hindu. Similarly, uh, in, in this birth, I may die as a Bengali or someone from the North East, or East Indian, but next birth, I will definitely as South Indian. But, okay. <laughs> now, my point of attention here is most of us, this is a general uh, thing, mostly applicable to professors and scholars, that Indian writing in English, when we introduce, we seldom introduce Indian English criticism in the classroom. That's the handicap. Because students should be facilitated with the writings and supported by Indian English criticism. When you are working on feminism, general tendency for the Indians, we start with British and American scholarship. Virginia Woolf. I'm a fan of Virginia Woolf. But it doesn't mean when I'll be writing on Indian feminism, I'll start with Virginia Woolf. I'll start with Uma Chakravarti. I'll start with Sharmila Rege. That means Indian gharana of feminism. Indian society, 
Indian literature, Indian anthropology, they demand Indi Indianized criticism. That means criticism from our own country. And it is not at all weak. It is a rich reservoir. You know C.S. Lakshmi from ten, uh, for your part of the country, C.S. Lakshmi. And she is the head of Sparrow, a big uh, group contributing to marginal studies and a leading feminist based in Mumbai, but originally from Tamil Nadu. And look at her contribution. My humble prelude in this afternoon to you. Whoever into criticism, into research, make available of your own understanding of Indian gharana, Indian tradition of criticism for your PhD dissertation. Enough is enough. Empire writes back. Bill Ashcroft's or empire writes back not. Our literature, our criticism, our age-old tradition is more and more resourceful than many of which you are trapped in. The problem is not yours. The problem is still colonial hangover. We start in the nursery level reciting the poem Daffodil, isn't it? I'm a great admirer of Wordsworth, but with due respect, the daffodil, when it is taught, the, the teacher is not, has not seen the flower, and the student has not seen the flower, and daffodil has been communicated. Tragedy of our syllabus. How syllabus is thrice removed from the, from the truth like Plato's bed. How syllabus is divorced from reality. We don't need the syllabus. Straightforward. We need a poem which is rooted in Tamil, which is, which is developed in Tamil, and will flower in Tamil. We have so many, if you in your lifetime, see daffodil or what's or sort of daffodil in the field, a beautiful flower, but we have plenty, 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 plenty more to celebrate. Why shall we be trapped? Our small poem translated or in, uh, in, in English. We have a lot of writers. I No, this year, Saitya Academy, Ambai. Ambai, Saitya Academy, this year, Lakshmi's book got the Saitya Academy Award, translated by Jijevi Prasad from Tamil Nadu. And recently, month back, Saitya Academy Award took place. But very interestingly, that small flabboom, a poem on flower, like, uh, uh, I can say, river, the river by Ramanujam, poem, a river, bhai gai, river bhai gai near Madurai, and look at the locale, and how you can relate yourself, if you are from Madurai, to that reading the river. My humble submission in the morning is, make yourself contextual. Make you, don't fall in the trap. Trap is everywhere. It's easy to, fra tra to be trapped. And we'll have to unlearn our own Eurocentric model of knowledge info, knowledge gathering. We gather our knowledge through the methods and means how the masters, quote unquote, ironically, satirically said, masters taught us to do. Now, why I am telling all this? There is always a binary, one imposing into this like this room. I think this part is closer than this part. I hope that part, but that part is more close to my heart than, of course, because look at the structure of this part. This is very much, of course, colonial, but within the colonial rich, we will definitely think that we are a democratic platform. We are a democratic citizen, OK? Now, coming back to what was, uh, I was talking about, the aesthetics. The universal aesthetics has a tendency of overgeneralization. When you think of literature, why do you need a separate category called Indian literature? Why do you need a separate category called American literature? Why do you need a separate category called Australian literature? That means 
you are already categorizing considering some broad perspectives which are not universal so denying the universality of some perspectives to look at things we are coming to studies isn't it now think of feminism why do we need a separate category called feminism again a divide again a binary again a creation of binary why do we need a subaltern literature can subaltern speak <laughs> this fame famous essay by guy to chakraborty spivak now there are some issues which are contextual local which are very difficult for the universal parameters to generalize coming to dalits it's very hard you you will struggle struggle and struggle to convince a foreigner about the dalits i tell you if you are a critic if you are meeting with the foreign scholar and it will be taking so much time for you to make them understand what is dalit and how are they so different why because of the total absence of dalit other than in indian sub indian india so my point here is the stratification social stratification in india is so unique so defined no foreigner can fathom it unless how he or she is rooted here for many 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 years because layers are very subtle and structures are so different even within india someone from tamil nadu someone from calcutta coming to tamil nadu understanding the dalit parameters within the city within the villages within the semi villages semi cities intersections are very different and also we will have to reach out to the laborers to the economically challenged people and also the other platforms and forums of society communities and how much that is operative in your community that is enormous india is such a huge country within india when as an editor i start writing a book or editing a book uh, about which has pan indian context i don't edit all alone these days because for me maharashtra is totally a state un unfathomable for me i may have a pocket knowledge for maharashtra but how can i get the good picture of maharashtra to the international readers the audience so the editors all the writers in india face this challenge every now and then all of you when you will be the writers for tomorrow you will be the facing the same challenge because you know your state better than myself but you may not know the state from where i am where i have the advantage over you but it doesn't mean that you are disqualified for writing writing is a process it should not be stopped but at the same time you will have to keep in mind how much democratic platform you can bring into that how much voices you can incorporate so this is a challenge for any indian writing about talking about dalits look at the perspectives of dalit in three persons one from bengal one from maharashtra one from tamil nadu they gave three totally different perspectives about three very prominent award winning writers representing their own community devoted to their communities i will talk i will call them as the dalit activists even then even total immersion into the subject even after total intense intense living with the subject how they are coming from that society that community they are different in perspectives and views and their take therefore it is very difficult for a foreign scholar almost one or couple of example uh, exa uh, exceptions like gay lambet i am reminded of gay lambet contributed a lot uh, based in mumbai but there are 
uh, you know, uniqueness of Dalit within the Indian social structure is, is kind of, it triggers off Indian critics, Indian Indians to react to the situation and understand the situation, appropriate with the situation, accept the situation, not to encash in politics, not to encash in politics, but in some states, it becomes an agenda for politics and political issues. But Dalit is a social reality. In this morning, I have another humble submission in front of you. Knowing about India, I will read Discovery, uh, <clears throat> Discovery of India by Jawaharlal Nehru. Knowing about India, I will read Mahatma Gandhi. I will also read Ambedkar's annihilation of caste because complete reading of India is holistic. Complete reading of India is impossible without reading Ambedkar, without reading Ambedkar's annihilation of caste because we need all the perceptions, all the perspectives because it is an undeniable fact of 18.7% in 2011 census of Dalit lives in India. And we have three perceptives. Another perspective I must add, I hope a couple of students from the Northeast region. One, okay, thank you. Uh, uh, you know, if you come to the Northeast, another beautiful, uh, you are from which state? Arunachal Pradesh, Mamandai state. Very good. Okay. So another beautiful aspect of that adds beauty to it, the ethnicity. The ethnicity. It's not the Ambedkar as a leader, but ethnic people. And most of the tribals, Adivasis in Jharkhand, West Bengal, uh, UP, Bihar, and many other perspectives, we all contribute to this narration. And Homi Bhabha has a book, Narration of the Nation. When we talk about the, uh, the perspective in the true sense of India, narration of nation is the prelude. That means the covering of the entire nation. Why do you need a separate category then for the Dalits? Because as all three mentioned, others also mentioned, the perspectives of Dalit lives are not inclusive of the other parameters, other studies. And it all started with a book, the book called Poisoned Bread by Arjun Dangle. And it is a 1992 book by Poisoned Bread, that is Arjun Dangle. And this Arjun Dangle's book, if you can think, this book revolutionized Indian English criticism and gave a new dimension called Dalit studies. Previously, we all know the rise of the Dalit uh, movement, Dalit Panthers in Maharashtra in early 1970s. Early 1950s, Ambedkar's role and influenced by Mahatma Phule, Mahatma Phule and Ambedkar is a flower in Mahatma Phule's garden. Mahatma Phule in Maharashtra planted Dalit Bhavana, Dalit Chetana, and Ambedkar became the flower in that garden. And 1950s, after the conversion to Buddhism, look at Ambedkar's role. And also, we'll have to trace back to 1932-33, the Gandhi-Ambedkar debate. That is a paramount of uh, all social resources in India. If we look into 1932-33 debate and leading to Pune Pact, Gandhi Ambedkar debate, you know, uh, India, uh, there is Lord Minto. Lord Minto thought of another shot of electorate for the marginalized or the untouchables and which was violently criticized by Mahatma Gandhi. Mahatma Gandhi didn't look into the social stratification as something to be a force that is 
to define the future of India in, uh, in the days to come. What Gandhi possibly could not see in his vision, with what was complete in the vision of Ambedkar, and Ambedkar thought that a separate electorate will give impetus to those who are suffering from generations up to generations as, as, uh, as the lower strata of human being within India. And we all know how all the matters traveled and Ambedkar's contribution for the security and safety of the social order through parliamentary constitution. He not only made provision for the Dalits, he also made provisions for the women. If you look into sections, the women liberations, and look at the contribution of Ambedkar, Hindu code bill. Hindu code bill was so disastrous before that, but Ambedkar made it so uh, flexible and it was an enormous contribution to women of India for their liberation in Ambedkar, uh, after Ambedkar. My point of thing is that if we look into just a quick survey of the history of the period, in the early 1950s, most of the Dalit writers like Anna Bhav Sate and many others, they were influenced by the uh, USSR, politics of the USSR, and the then time you all know, the Indian relationship with Russia and communism. So all the Dalit writers from Maharashtra, they had an influence by the Russians, that means Marxism and Lenin. So their uh, Dalit Chetana, Dalit Gharana in 1950s was holistic and proletariat based, proletariat based, you know, the lowest strata, economically lowest strata, bourgeois and proletariat, two very important facets and in communist manifesto, communist manifesto, okay. So in 1950s, if we look into the terminology as used by Dalit, that included women also. In 1950s, in a holistic definition of, uh, of Dalits, included marginal, whoever in marginal section, whoever had the experience of Dalan, Dalan means oppressed, whoever has, has undergone the process of machinery of Dalan, of being oppressed, are Dalits. So look at the change of the perspectives I am giving in a couple of minutes time. In 1960s, there was a budge time of production of Dalit writings from Maharashtra and Gujarat. Mostly, the writings came forward as a part of social change. Why did they write? Suppose in my writing, if I portray a character who is Dalit, is it a Dalit text? We will have to understand, if I make a character pitiable, sympathetic, is it a Dalit text? No. You and I will find your tiny old Tamil language in our Bangla language, so many of such characters in ancient time as well. That means those are sympathetic texts. Those are sympathizers. sympathizers. Those are not empathizers. We empathy is a different term than sympathy. Sympathy is not emancipation. Pity is not a process of emancipation. Dalit writing is a target writing that means with a definite purpose for social change. If a writing cannot change the perspective and social order, it fails to attain as a text, as a byproduct of a movement. Suppose, I think many women are sitting, if you write something about your emancipation, is it a feminist text? We'll have to consider how far it satisfies the constitutions of, of feminism. How far it satisfies is your claims and feminist movement. It's a movement. Movement means you need a constitution. You need placard and posters. You need definite process. Process means one of the processes, of course, your leaflets. Leaflets means writings, poems, short stories, autobiographies, life narrations, 
performing arts, drama, street drama. If you want to change society, I think many of you have seen the street drama, sarcastic drama on politics, issues on suppose the uh, fuel such, such as rise, like anything. That means how do they contribute to the movement? Movement is nothing that you will sleep on the bed and movement will think a movement will take place movement is nothing that you will dream i am a part of this this is not movement how active you are the activities the daily occurrences look at the dalit panther movement i am very fortunate Orjun Dangle is a good friend of mine and he took me to, in one of my visits to Mumbai, took me to all the places in 1974 where they participated in the movement. He took me to the place of, uh, took me to the place of Namdem Dhasal and many others who were the revolutionary figures and what were their missions. How did they chalk out plan? What were their action plans? Dharnas. Dharnas means protests. What were there? They had a printing press. He took me to a printing press. Printing press is important. Look at Indian independence time when we fought against the British. The role of printing press, you will have to... Role of Gita, role of the Gita. If you find any uh, freedom fighters in a jail, one book was common, that was Gita. That means... These are all parts and parts and parcels of a movement. So I'm talking about a movement that was, uh, that was generated in 1960s. Terrific. The body of resources are terrific. And literary productions are one dimensional for social change. Literature for the change of society. And 1960s was the basic structure from which 1970s was the flower. 1973-74, Mumbai became the, not the Mumbai, outskirts of Mumbai, outskirts of Mumbai became the hot place for Dalit movement. And the leaders were the champion writers. The leaders, leaders means activists, were the champion writers also. Look at the power of their language, power of the rhetoric that entered into the soul of Brahminical knowledge. Soul of Brahminical knowledge in a sense, the knowledge of the establishment. And look at the political upheaval in time. And it immediately sparked in the neighboring state called Gujarat, isn't it? So in Mumbai, and that is Mumbai and Gujarat, that means Maharashtra and Gujarat became the mitochondria, mitochondria, we all know, a mitochondria of Dalit discourse in 1970s, and which prompted life narrations. Byproduct of Dalit Panther movement was the life narrations. That means they started writing their own story, the story of their, you know, a pathetic story of their life, how they are denied from their rights in every sphere of life. And that life narration and then autobiographies. These autobiographies are part of the reading of the history course also, because this is an index to a movement. Autobiography are very important documentations to look into the history of the process. So 1970s and late 1970 onwards, it became a pan-Indian movement after the Maharashtran thing. But it took some years to take up a serious pedagogical uh, study or institutional discourse Till 1992 book Poison Bread came out in English. 1992 Poison Bread by Arjun Dangle. This book revolutionized Indian English criticism. And now in Maharashtra, Marathi literature has been translated into English. And immediately Tamil Nadu, Bengal, Bihar, Odisha, Delhi, 
Kerala all started collecting this book and translating it into vernacular. This is an important act. And while translating into vernaculars, the Dalit writers started amalgamating or accumulating, gathering knowledge from the book. And immediately the book acted like a catalyst for all Dalit writers in different vernaculars and immediately got attention into different university courses. Because now we have, a, we have one English book, one English critical book, which is a summation of speeches. It contains speeches, speech by Ambedkar also, speech by speech, all great speeches, essays, short stories, poems, and articles. Now it's a complete book in one package for Dalit discourse, Dalit criticism, in Dalit criticism, as well as in English translation, available in Indian universities. It entered into Aurangabad University, Bombay University, and it took another five, seven, ten years to enter into the traditional citadel of orthodoxical colonial universities. I won't mention any other name. I will mention only my university's name, Calcutta University, in the early part of 2000. Due to the total absence of translations, it took so much of time. Unless it has been available in English, you cannot include it in English syllabus, isn't it? So translation, as I mentioned, and I am mentioning again and again in different parts of the corners of the cities in India, is the heart of India. Translation from vernacular to English, and English not a foreign language. You and I are the bearers of English language now. English still survives because India uses it. India uses English, that's why the global people, people in the globe are going with English because India determines what will be the language of trade and commerce because think of American election. No government can ignore the mighty presence of Indians in the Silicon Valley. We are the defining factors of political ideologies in, in the world parameters. We determine the diplomatic situations in our bilateral relations. No one can deny our intellectual presence, our mighty, mighty resources, human resources. That is quite a paramount thing. You think of ICC, International Cricket Council, who is the president now? And how Indian India, uh, people say India, what India says, all will have to follow. Because who will come and watch your trivia, watch your game? You will play your game, no one will come to watch your play. Who will sponsor you? You will be sponsored, you means the foreigners, foreign cricket councils will be sponsored. Of course, BCCI, President Saurabh Ganguly now, is a mighty giant, is a determining factor. My point of attraction here is that that Dalit as a separate category, and if you look into 2000 onwards, in different perspectives, translations become part of it. And many Dalit writers own the very coveted uh, prizes, like Shaitya Academy Award, like uh, 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 different, and Orient Black Swan, Oxford University Press, and many in very important publishing houses took up Dalit studies seriously. That's very important because you need a good publisher, because you need to be seen worldwide. For that Oxford University Press, I always pronounce badly Professor Ahagarsan's name, Ajagarsan, isn't it? Madras University, yeah. Madras, uh, Madras University, uh, Professor Ayagarsan and Susi Tharu edited the Oxford University book of Dalit anthology. Susi Tharu was my teacher at uh, CIFL Hyderabad. 
Susi Tharu, they compiled the, the South Indian part of uh, Dalit literature. Similarly, uh, 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 similarly Tutun Mukherjee uh, of Hyderabad Central University edited our uh, Eastern part of uh, Dalit literature. Now, very important thing is that, why did I mention we need for total transformation, we need writers, we need critics to take up. The critics were reluctant, oh, Dalit writing, okay. Dalit writing, Dalits only can write about their own lives. This is a serious criticism against the subaltern writings. They always tend to fall and to fall in the trap of self-narration. If you look into the Aborigines in Australia, Maoris in New Zealand, Black Americans in America, the Africans, they are strong in writing about their own autobiography. Because it's not that they don't understand aesthetically qualified writing. Look at, I don't know how many of you have read that important text which will change your lives. I will recommend you to read Long Travel to uh, Freedom, that is Nelson Mandela. Nelson Mandela's Long Walk to Freedom. Long Walk to Freedom will take you to freedom. Long Walk to Freedom is not a book, it's a mission in your life. It will change your eyes, it will change your nose, it will change your ears and the brain and convert you directly into action, not in inaction. I recommend why to be orthodoxical in syllabuses and also in our studies. How many of us have read Kapil Dev's autobiography? How many of, I, uh, how many of you know the name of Kapil Dev? Kapil Dev who won the World Cup first time, 1983 World Cup. And straight from the heart is an autobiography by Kapil Dev. Straight from the heart is not straight from the heart, is straight from the field. It's straight from India. First time India made it visible in world cricket. It's an important date. Like the important date when Tamil Nadu, when Chennai decided Shami Vivekananda to be sent to Chicago in 1992. And you know, 1892. And that was a time in the World Parliament of Religion, Shamiji's speech was not a speech, speech of the nation. Speech that uplifted the morale of the nation and it made platform for the nation to be established permanently. Like similarly, 25th June 1983, Kapil Dev made the renaissance in Indian economy. He is a Renaissance man, made Indian economy prosperous, made cricket economy prosperous, isn't it? We cannot forget, as an Indian, if we die as an Indian, we cannot forget these names, these dates, because for them we survive, we exist, we will exist. The nation will crave for tomorrows. We plan for a better tomorrows with the sacrifice and tireless efforts with all these tall words. One generation invest, next generation in gases, isn't it? Now coming to the perspective that I was dealing with again, that when uh, we talk of uh, that very uh, criticism about any subaltern writing, Aborigine Australians, let me just give you a glimpse of two minutes. You will be surprised. There is a quote called Stolen Generation in Aborigine Australians. Stolen Generation means what? Now, if you are, and remember, Chennai, I always ca call as the capital of knowledge for Australian studies. Whatever capital of knowledge for Australian studies because of CT Indra, Professor C.T. Indira's enormous contribution to Chennai. And I had come many, of, many times, and she made a pioneering contribution 
and many great Australian writers, editors, critics visited Australia because of the Australian Centre at the University of Madras. I owe my gratitude to Professor C. T. Indira. Now, passing comment on stolen generation. Suppose you are born as an Aborigine in Australia in the city of Adelaide, South Australia. What was the mission of the government? Suddenly, the Aborigine couple is holding the sun out. Okay, three years, four years. Two or three government uh, car cabs will come and pick and snatch the child from the couple and they will be taken off. That means the father and mother will remain all alone and the son will be taken by snatched away by the police, Australian white police. And they will be sending the son to the another part of Australia, suppose Northern Territory, Darwin. The Australia is not one country. It is like the world, isn't it? The time difference is four hours, Perth to, uh, Perth to Sydney, four hours time difference. And uh, from Adelaide picked up and sent to Darwin in the Northern Territory. Why? If you, are, if you are a child, if you are detached from the aboriginal family and lineage and you will be brought out, brought up in a white man's house. Understand? So that your roots will be lost. So this is stolen generation, horrific, horrendous, criminal. And there is no law to protect you. There is no law to protect you. We in Indians... We are, those who have seen the Australian Aboriginal scenario, consider Ambedkar is more than a god. I tell you, Ambedkar stands to me more than a god after visiting Australia and talking to these stolen generation people. You just Google search stolen generation, stolen S-T-O-L-E-N generation. And you will also find several interviews with me with stolen, stolen generation writers. Ackerman. Ackerman is a very familiar face in India. And she is a leading writer from Australia. Stolen generation. She was born in South Australia and sent to the North, Northern Territory. And she could understand her parents when she was 45 years old. Somehow she could locate. But that was misfortune or fortune at all. Understand. Now, why do I say all these? Don't you think that Ackerman should write her life? Don't you think that Ackerman's life is different life than our life? Therefore, they need to write their own life first. How can your Brahminical knowledge criticize me if I face this? If I am a two years old girl and snatched away, brought up by a white, parent, white caretakers, and after all, my life will be snatched away. My childhood, my adulthood, my everything is snatched away. Don't you think my life is different? Don't you think I shall be writing my life first? How can the subaltern rit literature be criticized they, that they only fall back on writing their own life? I tell you another story. This man is from Bengal. Now he is the president of Dalit Academy in West Bengal. Monoranjan Bapari. You can Google Monoranjan Monoranjan. Bapari, B Y A P A R, Bapari. He was born in Bangladesh. He came to West Bengal at the age of four. Now, there is a very important thing, those this part of the world to understand. The refugee Dalit concept in Bengal. If you in Bangladesh, if you are a subaltern in Bangladesh, lower caste in Bangladesh. If when you come to Bengal as a refugee, 
you will be sent to refugee camps which are pathetic in condition but if you are brahmin coming to bengal as a refugee you will be settled in calcutta so the rehabilitation program by the center government and the state government were too inhuman monoranjan bapari's family after the partition of bengal partition of bengal appeared as a refugee and he lived in four refugee camps four refugee camps and in the refugee camps you will be surprised to know there were 500 for each village and there were only two toilets and they used to get only two half meals and one dress every year one dress every year that was the central and the state government policy for the refugees in dandakaranna and different refugee camps kunti transit camp siromani akali camp like these and manoranjan bapari had to suffer in all these had to stay in all these camps and when he was arrested very easily you know police can give a case after the camps when he was released police gave him a ca uh, case as a, as a as a mouse and put him into jail and in the jail he started writing bengali alphabets and that was at the age of 24 now at the age of 64 he is one of the prominent bengali writers and the first book he wrote is the autobiography of him now tell me you are all prosperous bright nation builders is it a criminal offense from his part to write come out with the first book as the autobiography because he is the oppressed feeling the feeling of subjugation the feeling of an obliger obliged obliged and a feeling of being processed and executed the feeling of been fractured why it should come out first to me it should come out first to manoranjan bapari it came first to manoranjan bapari therefore the first book iti vritte chandal jivan my chandal life it is available in english in translation is his narration of his own story that story you and i never lived you and i i never denied of my qualities rights you and i have a blessed life far better than manoranjan bapari therefore if you look into dalit writing as predominantly autobiographical narrations it's a criminal offense from the part of the critics critics because there are elements of aestheticism which are to be understood from the parameters and praxis from the eyes of the dalits what are very important things therefore i know many of you are aware of one of the bright stars of the city meena kandasamy tamil cyclonic dalit feminist meena is a very close friend of mine and i reviewed her first book and i was also a jury to her one of her programs abroad look at meena's first book title what is first book title touch touching is important in dalit isn't it for untouchability touch is important if you read touch you will be touched and there are fiery poems very fire and very importantly who wrote the foreword to the book can anyone in the hall who wrote to the foreword to the book meena kandasamy's foreword was written touch was written by another great great feminist writer kamala das
Kamala Das wrote the foreword to Meena Kandasamy's book and read the foreword, what uh, Kamala Das writes. These forewords are very important means of critical writings. And um, Kamala Das says in Meena Kandasamy's foreword, 2006 book, Touch, the book will revolutionize Indian minds, quote unquote. The book will revolutionize Indian minds. Look at the contribution. Dalits and non-Dalits alike. After reading the book, you will be a changed person. Of course, you will be a changed person. If you wait, that one. Just a second. This is Meena Kandasamy. Look at the poem. Look at the poem. Take a beautiful... Repeat steps three to four, six times. Display the end product. It is a Brahmin end. Look at poem. It's an act of sword. It's a poem aesthetically satisfying for your rebellious qualities. The poem will shock the city. The poem will shock the Brahminical, orthodoxical parameters and perspectives of the country. And look, he star she starts with begin and starts with end. Next. This is a very revolutionary poem by Kalani Thakur Charal. And the poem, if you can read, is a poem about denial. My grandfather was prohibited from stepping into the toll premises. Toll is a patshala, school, school form. My father became literate using palm leaf and ink of charcoal after a long struggle. My mother visited Durga Bari, that means Durga temple premises, with cow dung on her left hand to face the place where she was standing. That means, you, if you were born as a Dalit, you will have to carry the cow down. And if you are standing here, after you remove, you will have to face the, with the cow down. This is India. This is not only, this is also a part of India. We cannot deny the mighty part which is contributed to it. Okay. Next one. Oh God, cow dung is holier. Look at the her title. Oh God, cow dung is holier. The touch of a Dalit than the touch of a Dalit. My gentle colleagues enjoy using abusive terms. Chamar, charal, dom. Charal is someone who who uh, who takes the crematorial process. Crematorial process. Okay. They have forgotten that these terms and names of different castes and communities. My point here is, what are these poems? Look at Kamala Das. Look at any feminist poem. They talk about a revolt, angst against society. And it, the poems are, or writings are, for social justice. These are the literature. These are the militant literature. We need to be militant in order to qualify myself as a writer. This militancy is not outrageous. This militancy comes out of generations and generations of oppression, subjugation, and submission to the altar of knowledge. And the altar of knowledge is Brahminical. The altar of knowledge, the establishment is always, it, 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 it has its own plans and very difficult to change plans. 
these poems, Meena Kandasamy and Kalani Thakucharal, these are two examples. And how to look at Dalit literature or Aboriginal literature, Maori literature in New Zealand. Maori are the, I call the Dalits as the saviors of the country. I call the, the Aborigines as the saviors of Australia. I call the, new, uh, the Maoris as the saviors of New Zealand. If you go to Australia for any university program, college program, or government program, the program will begin with the lines like this. We solemnly remember the contributions of these race and we, they are generous to give us this platform. That means the community, suppose you go to South, South Australia, capital Adelaide, and each and every college and university, government institutions, or government exhibitions, ministerial talks will begin by homage to the landowners because they were the settling country. The whites were the settled, settled there, whites settled there. The white did not come here for settlement. They came here to loot. But in Australia, they were transplanted to Australia uh, for different reasons. And also, there was a settler community there. And now, every government in Australia, every province, they are giving right. Any program will begin to the prelude to the, to the saviors of the country, the original inheritors of that land. That is intimacy. Now, for my point of... Uh, <clears throat> Just a brief characteristics and features of Dalit literature. Number one, Dalit literature is human literature. Now, why human literature? It talks about humanity, greater humanity. When humanity is at a loss, all Dalits talk about the restoration of the platform, restoration of sanctity and the sovereignty, rights of people, so all Dalit literature, literature of humanity. And their rebellion in nature <clears throat> and in texture, language is very bold. Language is very bold because they, are, they will shock you. They will give you shock and they will shatter you like anything. What am I reading? OK, that is very militant use of language. Dalit literature has several references to mother. If you look into Dalit writings, there are so many in our different languages, I could perceive at least 10 stories titled mother in different regional Dalit writings. The concept of mother is very important in Dalit narratives. Even in Sharan Kumar Limbare's Akarmasi, of Akarmasi, Sharan Kumar Limbale's autobiography. It's all about the deconstruction of mother, the universal Indian motherhood, and side by side, Dalit conception of motherhood. Very important conception to look at. <clears throat> water. Water is a very important symbol in Dalit writings because water in general perspective are denied, okay? But of course, no one can stop the sun rising for tomorrow. That means things are changing fast. Of course, knowledge is power. More knowledgeable we are, by knowledgeable I mean internally knowledgeable and more powerful we are to transform our mind, transform our eyes. Another important factor of Dalit writings, of course, is the form and content. Which one is a more important? For either to look at form or to content. If we look into last 10, 15 years of time, there are aesthetically satisfying writings have come up in vernacular Dalit writings as well as in English. Now, new generations with English knowledge, many Dalit writers 
a straight way like meena meena is a phd in english from iit mumbai iit chennai okay iit chennai and uh, many are writing in powerful english and meena is also got a training from abroad uk, UK. similarly uh, satyanarayan see satyanarayan satyanarayan actually um, from kerala and now he is also in university of east anglia on a fellowship so all they come out with a powerful language that they engage therefore dalit writing cannot be judged through universal parameters that we are associated with we need different terms eyes constructions to look at dalit ideas of beauty concocted amalgamated embraced within the codified text therefore when we read dalit poems when we read dalit narratives dalit plays plays are very important because there are there are a lot of ambedkarite plays in maharashtra in uh, different parts of india gujarat very important nirav patel nirav patel main uh, made a very important contribution to he died recently but a very important contribution to dalit studies in gujarat and different centers which are promoting dalit writings like state dalit centers i think madras also have one one isn't it similarly gujarat dalit sahitya sangstha bengal dalit sahitya sangstha then all dalits center and state government agencies they are also propagating and encouraging the writers by organizing training programs workshops and honing the skills after all i will conclude my talk with one uh, address to all of you there is the aroma we all are carrying there is one creativity we are all carrying the end product of knowledge end product of your education or we call in a institutional way learning outcome the learning outcome is innovation what you innovate at the end of the course i wish all of you will be very prominent in writing because many of uh, writers from tamil nadu different parts of tamil nadu and the chennai city have own the hearts and heads of the nations why on the hearts and heads of the nations the entire globe similarly you will also take up the challenge of writing back with your own roots your own heritage your lineage your education and your associations and never think whatever way you contribute is something uh, not done always it is an act of process it is an act of emancipation your own vernacular is your strongest pillar use it hold it touch it turn it into effective measures enjoy the power of knowledge read all write your own amalgamate all the subject boundaries don't think that literature is for literature read political science read uh, sociology read anthropology read all social parameters to build up the structures of your own and then deliver while delivering you amalgamate the knowledge you have therefore the aesthetics we have been touching upon is a general universal aesthetics but we need contextualized localized aesthetics as well because one leg will be locally rooted and another leg will be universally planted that means rabindranath tagore has a beautiful novel called ghare baire home and the world your local is your home and the world is your universal home so you have two legs and use your two legs effectively and make the best flower in front of you i wish 
all of your journeys as prosperous nation builders, nation builders, nation builders. Thank you.